welcome to HHH, the podcast where we talk about the horrible humans in history. I am your host, Angela Pearson. And guys, I have a confession and kind of a funny story to tell you about this week. So I was fully planning on doing, you know, two for one. You're going to get some double the pleasure with two horrible people in one story. Um, well, as I did my research, the name Amelia was the main name in this story. And as I did my research, <laughs> I searched for Amelia, who, you know, you'll find out the story and the details of the story, but I searched and two names popped up and the s stories that I was reading from all of the different sources were very similar uh, but one of them didn't include the other individual I was going to talk about. So I did all my research, collected all the information, and, you know, I wasn't suspicious because most of our horrible humans in history change their names, right? They have multiple aliases, and that is still the case for the individual we're going to talk about today. So I didn't think anything of it until I was like, they never mentioned this other person, and this was their co-conspirator. This was their partner in crime. Come to find out, guys, there are two women in the same time period who did the same kind of crimes with the same first name. So I had no idea that these were different people. So you're just going to have to experience something completely different today than what I was planning. So today we are actually going to be talking about Amelia Dyer. I know I told you that we were going to talk about two other individuals, which we will talk about a different time, but today we're going to talk about Amelia Dyer. And this woman, I tell you what, if you see a picture of her, she looks so stern and mean and like she just looks awful. Like she would just like slap you upside the head if you said the wrong thing. That's kind of what she looks like. But this woman, it's said that she has killed over 400 infants in her 30 year long career as a baby killer. So today, despite what I told you last week, just ignore that. We are going to be talking about Amelia Dyer, the baby killer. All right, all right. So let's get into this lady's life. So Frances Amelia Thorne, or Hobley, changed to Hobley at one point. And it changed to Dreyer. See why? See why I get confused, guys? They change their names so much. So, um, Frances Amelia Thorne was actually born May 5th, 1836, in Ham Hamperston, Dorset. She was the fourth child of seven. And she had three brothers and three sisters. Two of her sisters actually died when they were still very, very young. So she experienced tragedy pretty early in her life. And her father um, was Samuel Hobley. He was a master shoemaker and he was able to send his children to school. And her mother's name was Sarah. Her mother actually contracted typhus, triggering severe mental illness which would cause really scary outbursts. And Amelia, at a very young age, became her mother's primary caregiver because she was the only one who could do it. And so she had to deal with a lot of those crazy outbursts. And it, it was pretty scary behavior for a young child to be dealing with. She was so young, her mother actually died when she was 11 years old. So... For a few years, this girl had to take care of her mentally ill, slowly dying mother, which I'm sure affected her very deeply. And later you'll see how that could have possibly affected her. So she actually was able to go to school, like I mentioned. 
She only went to school until she was 14. And then she actually became an apprentice in a corset making shop. In 1896, she married George Thomas. So that's when she changed her name to Amelia Thomas. And her husband, George, was actually 58 years old. And Amelia was 24. That was quite the age gap there. And she actually trained to become a nurse after she became married. And she met a woman during her nurse's training that would change the course of Amelia's life. So she met Ellen Dane, who was a nurse for babies and mothers and specifically really cared about those mothers who didn't have anyone. They were the single mothers who were being shunned by society. Um, Ellen Dane really loved helping those women. And that made a really deep impact on Amelia. And that impact would simmer over the next few years. But it would have a lasting and changing impact on her life. So Amelia was a nurse for quite a while in the infirmary, but had to quit because she actually became pregnant. So at this time period, if you were a pregnant woman, you were not allowed to work. You could not work. So because she became pregnant, she had to quit her nursing job. And in 1864, 26-year-old Amelia actually gave birth to a little girl named Ellen. And just a few years later, her husband actually would pass away. And now that she didn't have a husband to help care for her child, she was a single mother. She didn't know what to do. So Ellen's influence started to take hold. And inspired by Ellen, she started her own practice of helping single mothers with their babies. And she was she was well known for being very kind and loving, and she doted on children so much. Whenever she had the chance, she just doted on children and loved them so much. And she was so concerned about children that she ended up opening a nursing home herself in East Fletchley, London, called the Claymore House. This quote-unquote nursing home, it's not like the nursing homes that we know today. It wasn't for elderly people. This was actually specifically for young mothers, and she specifically targeted the unwed mothers when they needed the help the most. So. It's very ironic, and you'll see why a little later, that she was well known for being a kind and loving soul, especially to children, and that she doted on children. It just makes the whole story so much more creepy and so much more eerie <laughs> to know that she was so good at faking caring for these children. So Amelia promised these mothers when they would come for her help that they could leave their unwanted baby with her and she would arrange an adoption for the child. And of course, she had to charge a small fee of 25 to 30 pounds. Of course, you know, as you would. So she made all these promises to take care of these children and send them out to be adopted. And this was a practice called baby farming. And I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about that in a second. But there's a detail you need to know that Amelia farmed out her own daughter because she couldn't work and take care of a child at the same time. She couldn't run this new business of hers and have a child. So she actually adopted out her own child to another family because she couldn't run a business and have a child. So Amelia started actually advertising all of her services in the newspaper. 
Um, one of the adverts read like this. She said, announcement, before, during, skilled nursing, home comforts, baby can remain. And a lot of her other advertisements, she would make false claims that, oh, family looking for adorable baby, don't care if it's a boy or a girl. It's a warm, loving family with both parents that are just desperate to have a child of our own. And that's how she would describe it. And then these mothers would reach out to her and she would help these single mothers who had no options. And another, so this is a quote from one of her actual advertisements. Married couple with no family would adopt a healthy child, nice country home, terms 10 pounds, so they had to pay 10 pounds, Parting, care of ship's letter exchange, Stokes, Croft, and Bristol. She was a single woman who did not live in the country. She lived in the city. And she was charging these people to take their children off of their hands. Now, before I can continue on the story, it's already sounding pretty horrible. But I need to explain exactly what baby farming was because it it is such an insane idea and the fact that it actually happened is just mind-blowing to me but at this time 15 percent of the children in victorian england died before their first birthday just just think about that 15 percent of the children died before their first birthday so the mortality rate was crazy. And most of these children ended up being homeless. There was 30,000 homeless children that wandered the streets at this time in Victorian England. 30,000 homeless children. These aren't like teenagers. These are young, young children. So poor single mothers, especially if the child was illegitimate, were basically left with zero options. It was an option of, I give up my child and leave my child and abandon my child so I can continue to survive, or I keep my child and we both die. So a lot of single mothers would end up just giving up on their child and Society shunned them, especially if they were illegitimate children. They looked so down on these women. They didn't have a chance, basically. It was horrible. They even passed a law that was called the Poor Law. And it put this act into place where it freed men of the responsibility of providing for illegitimate children that they had fathered. Because, and their reasoning was because they believed if the man was no longer responsible, the women would step up and be morally good and it would enhance the morality of the society. That's what they believed. But what actually ended up happening was these women were left high and dry with no options, nowhere to go, no money to take care of them or their children. So they were left in this crazy circumstance of either giving up their child or basically dying. (laughs) Like, it was not great options. So majority of women actually ended up uh, choosing baby farms. And I'll explain those in a second. But majority of these women were actually governesses or servants or barmaids that would be in this situation. So it's not a lot of the upper class people. It's more of the servants and the people who are serving people that ended up in this situation that would have to use the services of these baby farmers. One in 12 women were actually prostitutes at this time. And children born in just normal circumstances only had a 50% chance to live past the age of five. Past the age of five. So a 15% chance that they'll live to their first birthday. And then a 50% chance that they will not make it to their fifth birthday. That is crazy. 
So with no other options, women would turn to these baby farmers. Now, it sounds awful and it genuinely is, but majority of the women that were starting these baby farmers were good women that were trying to help and trying to give these women a chance. Um, So what would happen is these women would take in the babies and foster them, feeding them, raising them until they were at the ripe old age to take care of themselves. Well, what age do you think that is? I guarantee whatever you're thinking, it's definitely lower. They would care for them until the ripe old age of seven when they could go and get a job and provide for themselves. Seven. I don't know if you have seven-year-olds around you, if you yourself have a child that's seven, or if you have a brother, sister, niece, nephew that's seven. I just want you to imagine them having to get a job and provide for themselves because they would no longer have a place to live if they didn't. It is insane. (laughs) And there were over 2,000 baby farmers in the mid-19th century in London. 2,000 of these people that were trying to help these women. Now, they would take unwanted children, mostly infants, and most of the time they charged a fee. The fee wouldn't actually be enough most of the time to actually feed or clothe the child. So even the people with the biggest hearts and the purest intentions, a lot of those babies would end up dying and they would die of malnutrition or neglect because they just did not have the money to pay for them, no matter how hard they tried. And one thing that they often did, because, you know, if a baby's starving and super hungry, what do they do? They cry and they cry and they cry. So these women who were taking all of these babies in and they had a lot of babies that were coming in, they would have quite a few in their home at a time. So to help keep their sanity, a lot of these women would use a drug called laudanum to sedate the babies and any children in their care. So laudanum basically just mellowed them out and made them sleep. So a lot of children would stop crying, go to sleep, and never wake up again because they would die of starvation or neglect. And it made that job so much easier. And just a sidebar, Amelia loved laudanum herself. She would drink it herself and she would self-medicate with that just to kind of help her get through. So just so you know, that's a side note and it's important because it helped her to disconnect from what she was doing, which we will get into very shortly. So now if the baby, um, took too long to get adopted out, like I said, if they were on the laudanum too long and they weren't getting adopted out and they continued to give them laudanum, even if they didn't die of starvation or malnourishment, many of them would die because of other health issues that were caused by the laudanum. So it was kind of a catch-22. You kill them with malnourishment or you kill them because you're over-drugging them (laughs) and it causes diseases. So it was not a great situation. It was not ideal, but these women were desperate and they knew what would happen to their babies, but they were so desperate and at least someone was willing to care for them. Or at least that's what they thought. Amelia came across as kind, gentle, motherly, but she took this baby farming and turned it into a business, a lucrative business, and saw babies and children 
as a source of income. So Amelia, at first when she opened up her own sanctuary for these women, offered women something called a quiet birth. So what that means is when the woman was in labor and the baby's head would emerge, Amelia would immediately cover the baby's nose and mouth, preventing it from being able to breathe. And you might ask, well, why? Why would she do that? Sometimes the mother wouldn't actually know that this is what she was doing, but this made the baby's death look indistinguishable from a stillborn birth. Because the baby never took a breath of oxygen, so they wouldn't turn purple. That is why she did that. So she could be like, oh, I'm so sorry. The baby wasn't alive. When in fact, she was the one who killed it. Um, so when she was given live babies to actually care for, she at first would just give them a bunch of laudanum and then leave them to die of neglect and starvation. So she would quiet them down so they wouldn't cry and then never touch them again, basically. This is how she started out in her baby farming business. She was killing babies as they were born and then just leaving them alone to die on their own if they were already born. In 1870, a woman named Margaret Waters was actually arrested and hung for doing the exact same thing that Amelia was doing. So the law was not super happy with the women that were doing these kinds of things. And if they found out that you were intentionally leaving these babies to die, they were going to find you. And this terrified Amelia because she knew what she was doing to these babies. So. It scared her so much that she actually quit baby farming. I mean, at least she quit baby farming for a little bit anyways. She worked um, for a while as a nurse in an insane asylum. <laughs> yeah, you'll see why that's ironic. I keep saying that, but it, you'll find out why that's so ironic. But in 1872, she actually remarried. She married a man named William Dyer, so the, hence her name, Amelia Dyer. Um, soon after their marriage, she actually went back to being a baby farmer. And soon there would be more and more infant deaths that happened in her home. And a coroner actually would come to her home and record all the deaths and at first, the coroner deemed them all natural causes. They all just seemed like they were dying of malnourishment or neglect. And it, it basically seemed like any other baby farm. And the coroner just kind of waved it off as all natural causes. Well, in 1873, she and William actually had a child together, a little girl named Marianne. And they would also have a little boy in 1876. So just a couple years later, they would have their son named William. Shortly after their son was born, though, the two of them would separate. She would leave her second husband. And at that point, she needed her business to thrive because now she was alone again and needed to be able to provide for herself. So. She started putting more and more ads out in the paper, looking for women to help adopt out their unwanted child. You can't see that, but I'm doing air quotes. Adopt out their unwanted child. So in 1879, after so many visits to this household and so many babies dying, the coroner actually started getting a little suspicious. I mean, it just took him a couple years, you know, to start thinking, hmm, this seems like an abnormal amount of babies are dying in this house. So after four babies died in four weeks, there was an inquest into their deaths. And Amelia freaked out because she knew she was going to get caught. 
So what did she do? She actually chugged two bottles of laudanum, which, by the way, would kill any normal person. That is a huge amount of a drug to be taking. But because she had been self-medicating with it for so long, she had built up an immunity to this drug. So she did end up in the hospital, but it definitely did not kill her. So she actually told the doctors th- that, um, quote, I took about the right amount. I'm part doctor myself. While she was in the hospital recovering from drinking the two bottles of laudanum. And after the inquest, they actually couldn't find any proof that she had deliberately harmed the child. And they found that she was super neglectful and like really bad at her job of caring for infants. And because she had been so incredibly neglectful, they did actually sentence her and they couldn't charge her with murder. It was just neglect. And she received, well, and they didn't actually punish her for the neglect. I take that back. They punished her because she was an unregistered house. They couldn't really do anything about the neglect, but they were going to charge her because she hadn't gotten a license to practice. So she got convicted of that. I just, (laughs) my mind is blown that they couldn't do anything about the neglected dying babies everywhere, which I guess it was normal in this time period to find Babies' bodies around town, like in the streets or on a bridge of abandoned babies, but like not being able to charge her at all for the neglect, it's just crazy. So she was found guilty of not having a license and sentenced to six months of labor. That was the maximum sentence. So she was leaving these babies to die, and her maximum sentence was six months of labor. That is infuriating. (laughs) So after she served her time, after the six months was over, she went back to making corsets, but obviously eventually went back to baby farming in 1884. And at this point in time, she didn't want to run the risk of people coming across the neglected baby's bodies. She didn't want to go to jail again. So she needed to become more clever on how she was killing and disposing of these babies. So, what did she decide to do? Oh, don't worry. She decided that from now on, instead of letting the babies just languish and slowly die, she was just going to kill them immediately. Why not? That sounds like a much better plan. So, she would actually tie white dressmaker's tape which is basically like tape measures. Like if you're into sewing or anything, it's like the tape measure you would use to judge sizes and measure out clothes for people. That's what she would take and wrap around the baby's neck to make sure that they died. She would strangle them. And to stay undiscovered, she actually started moving pretty frequently. So the police couldn't actually find her and anyone else that might be suspicious of the number of babies' deaths on her hands couldn't find her. Like the coroners and, you know, mothers and those kinds of things. So she moved around quite a bit. Now, while all of this was happening in Amelia's life, as she merrily went around killing babies because she's evil, um... Society was finally waking up and their mentality towards children was starting to take a drastic shift. They actually started caring about how children were treated and realized that they should maybe be taking better care of the babies and children in their society. So in 1881, The first Child Protective Agency was formed called the Waifs and Strays Society, and soon to follow that would be the NSCC, the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. 
So society started to actually care about what was happening to all of these homeless children and the babies, which is going to deeply affect Amelia's future. She doesn't know that yet. But in 1890, there was a young governess who would give her illegitimate baby to Amelia because she wasn't going to be able to keep her job if she kept this baby. So after time passed, the governess actually married the father of the child and they decided they wanted their baby back. So it had only been a couple months. So the young woman arrived at Amelia's doorstep. And remember, Amelia doesn't keep these babies around. She uh, gets rid of them very quickly. So I'm sure when this young lady showed up on her doorstep, Amelia freaked out and was panicking. But on the surface, she looked calm and cool and was like, oh, you want your baby? Okay, let me go get him. So she actually went and grabbed another baby that was in her possession and placed it in the arms of the woman. And the woman immediately was like, um, excuse me, this is not my child. Where is my child? And Amelia's response was, oh, that's your child. They just change so much in the short amount of time that this passed. Like, they just grow so much. What don't you say? And the woman was like, yeah, no, this is not my child. I know this isn't my child. And Amelia kept insisting, no, it is. I promise you, this is your baby. I swear. Well, what Amelia didn't know was that This woman's baby had been born with a birthmark on his hip. So the woman quickly undressed the child and looked at the hip and, shocker, there was no birthmark. And so the woman freaks out and is like, I want my baby. Give me my baby. And Amelia shoes her out quickly. But the woman wouldn't have it. She went to the police to explain what happened but there wasn't very much that they could do about it because when they asked Amelia what had happened, Amelia told them, well, you know, I adopted the baby out. I have no way to know where the baby is anymore. There's no way I could find their child. Well, shortly after this encounter, Amelia would have a mental breakdown and threaten to kill herself and eventually ended up in an insane asylum, the Wells Mental Asylum in Bristol. And remember, she grew up with a legitimately insane mother. So she knew how to act, to act insane. And I don't know if she had this melt- mental breakdown because she suddenly felt a lot of guilt about robbing this woman of her child because now the child was gone and the mother wanted the child back or which I think this or is actually the case she was just trying to get out of being punished and she knew if she was in a mental hospital no one could bother her about anything she didn't actually feel guilty or anything and she wasn't actually crazy she was just trying to escape from her consequences of her actions I don't know which one's actually true let me know what you think but I don't think she actually felt guilt. I wish that was the case, but I doubt it. I very much doubt it. So once she was released from the mental hospital, (laughs) I bet you can guess what she did. If you said she started another baby farm, you would be correct. She moved addresses again to try and escape the governess. But the governess would not have it. She found her again and wanted her baby back and would just pound on the door demanding that Amelia give her child back. And wouldn't you know it, Amelia had another mental breakdown. So conveniently just got stressed out and ended up overdosing on laudanum again. And so she went to the Somerset Insane Asylum this time. So she was admitted to the insane asylum and then 
eventually was released again and again started baby farming. And like I said, I feel like these breakdowns are either caused by guilt because she knew she was murdering babies or she was just trying to escape consequences. And again, the governess would not leave her alone. In fact, this time after Amelia got out of the insane asylum, she actually brought the police with her. And what do you think Amelia did? I bet in a million years you could never guess. I mean, you guessed. She went back to an insane asylum to escape the police. But this time, the asylum actually turned her away and told her she was not allowed to come in. And then she tried to take her own life, but was admitted to at the Bristol General Hospital. So she was in that hospital for a while. And when she got out of the hospital, she actually changed her ways and became a really wholesome person and went and served others in the community. Ha, just kidding. That is not what happened. <laughs> you guessed it. She opened another baby farm. So she opened this baby farm. And then again, to avoid consequences as this mother continued to hunt her down, she ended up in another asylum. And then when they released her from this one, they sent her to the Bristol workhouse. So she finally stopped the cycle of Insane Asylum, Baby Farm, Insane Asylum, Baby Farm. That I literally, as I was doing my research, I'm like, is this the rest of her life? Can I just say, and then forever long, she did this cycle. Okay, it finally finished because she is now in a workhouse in Bristol. And in this workhouse, she met an older woman named Jane Smith. She was a sweet old woman and she never planned on leaving the workhouse, but then she met Amelia and Amelia presented her with a business idea. I bet you know what the business idea was. Yes. Yes, it was baby farming. It was definitely baby farming. But the craziest part about this is I think Jane genuinely wanted to help these babies and really wanted to make a difference in society. The craziest part, though, is she agreed to allow Amelia to call her mother because that was their new scheme. I mean, Amelia's new scheme. I don't think Jane had any malice in her body to want to hurt anyone, but she, Amelia, would claim that Jane was her mother and tell people, because now women were starting to get really suspicious of these baby farmers because a couple more women had actually been hung. So two more women had been hung for killing innocent children as baby farmers. So women were really starting to have a large mistrust of people who claimed to be baby farmers. And Amelia would use Jane as kind of like a, oh, look, I'm with my older mother. We're a mother-daughter company. Like, there's no way we would hurt this innocent child. Because this is, this is Granny Smith. She would never hurt a child. So Amelia used that to really convince women of the safety of their, of their baby farm. Because how can you mistrust an elderly woman? Like, there's no way that they would ever lie or mistreat a child, right? I mean, I guess back then it was more innocent times, but I just, oh. So Amelia took advantage of Jane and her elderliness, I guess I will call it that. So many more women actually started entrusting their children in Amelia's care because it was Amelia and her mother. They didn't know that it was a lie. So in 1895, Amelia actually moved her business to Reading, bringing along her quote-unquote mother and lived at 26 Piggott's Road, Caversham, which was really close to the River Thames. And spoiler alert, that address is important. You don't have to 
remember the details of it, but that is an important thing in our story. So this location was actually really amazing for Amelia because now she had a place where she could dispose of the baby's bodies super easily once she was done strangling them. She began advertising her services in the newspaper, attracting many, many, many young women to her services, um, often having her quote-unquote mother come with her to reassure them that they'll be safe and like claimed that they would be going to a very loving, warm home that would just care for them and love them forever. And she would actually meet these women at train stations, take the baby, and of course the fee, she would not leave unless that fee was paid. And once she had the money, the baby was no longer useful for her. At least that's how she saw it in her mind. She would kill the baby within days, even hours after picking up the child. She would keep the body in her home just long enough so it would decompose so it was unrecognizable. So if the body was ever found, no one would actually be able to know whose child it was. And then once it was to her liking, she would dump it in the river. And at this point, I do want to remind you that Amelia had children. She had a daughter and a son. Her daughter was now 20 and was married to a man named Arthur Ernest Palmer. And they actually moved in with Amelia and Jane pretty shortly after they moved there. And they did not notice. I don't know how they did not notice all the baby murders. Like Jane and Amelia's daughter, Mary, I think it's Marianne and her uh, brother, son-in-law. I almost said brother-in-law. <laughs> son-in-law, Ernest. Like how they never noticed that these babies just were disappearing so quickly. It just blows my mind that, but it was the case. That's that's genuinely what happened because Jane often would go with Amelia to pick up the babies from the train station, like I mentioned. So the women would see her motherly presence and she actually never, ever participated in the murders. In fact, With so many babies moving through the home so quickly, Jane actually became suspicious as to what her business partner was actually doing with all the babies because it was very strange that she was collecting so many babies, but Jane never saw them again. So she soon couldn't take the suspicion anymore. It was was really bothering her. So she made a report the NSCC that actually triggered an investigation into Amelia and the inspector was actually more upset when they came to do the investigation that Amelia did not have a license than he was about the missing children. So this is the person who is supposed to be caring about children's safety and he cares more that she doesn't have a license than the fact that Jane reported There are a lot of missing babies. That tells you a lot about this time period. I will tell you what. That is just so mind-blowing to me. So all they actually did after Jane complained was make a note of her complaint. Period. That's it. They never punished Amelia. They didn't investigate further. They just made a quick note of it. Now, a few weeks after Jane had reported this and the investigators had come, Jane found a really suspicious package in their kitchen. It smelled really, really bad. And Jane was actually way too afraid to open the package because she had some suspicions as to what was going to be inside of that package. So she just left it alone. And after complaints from neighbors... That package actually disappeared and Jane saw Amelia scrubbing down the counter where that parcel had been sitting, which was very out of place for Amelia to do. So soon after the investigation, it spooked Amelia. She moved again because she did not want another visit from the NSCC or the police. 
And her son and daughter, or son-in-law and daughter, actually moved to London at this time. So they separated. And again, how did they not know? They sh- they must have been oblivious as to what was happening in their own home. <laughs> like, so that's all I can think of. But in 1896, Evelyn Marmon actually found one of Amelia's advertisements in the newspaper and was in desperate need of Amelia's services. So she sent Amelia a message. So she did like a telegram kind of thing. And Amelia responded with a letter stating that she was a woman who had no children and desperately longed to have one of her own. She lived in a humble house, but the child would be well cared for and well loved by her and her loving husband. That freaking lying sack of potatoes. Can you imagine, like, none of that was true. But Evelyn, Evelina, sorry, Evelina had no way of knowing that Amelia was lying. She was getting catfished, basically, by by Amelia. So Evelina was convinced, though, that this was the right fit for her child because she really, really loved her child and really desperately wanted her child to be well taken care of because she wanted to keep her but could not so even evelina believed her so when she agreed that when she gave birth that amelia could come and take the baby and amelia tricked so many women into doing this and believing this lie like it just breaks my heart to think about Now, on March 30th, 1896, in the small town of Reading, remember, she had lived in Reading, um, in the River Thames, about 40 miles away from London, a man was working on the river and spotted a parcel just kind of floating in the water. When he opened it, he found something wrapped up in multiple layers of newspaper and linen with actually a brick in the bottom to weigh the bag down. Well, when he started unwrapping the paper and the linen, he discovered the decomposing body of a baby girl. And it was obvious that the baby had not died of natural causes because what did they find around the baby's neck? But the white dressing tape tied in a knot right below the baby's left ear. Now, whoever killed the baby must have assumed no one would find it. Or they were really bad criminals, which I think Amelia is just a really bad criminal because within the paper, they discovered an envelope that still contained an address and a name. Now, James Beattie was the lead investigator on this case, and he was the one who actually found the envelope that had the address to Miss Thomas at 26 Piggott's Road in Caversham. Caversham, sorry. And when the police went to this address, they discovered that Mrs. Thomas was no longer living there, but... The postal worker actually knew where she had moved to and pointed them to the address in Kensington on Kensington Road, just a few miles across the river. So the police were now hot on her heels because she was a dummy and included an envelope with her name and address to cover the baby that she had murdered. So... The next day after the body was found, Amelia was actually on her way to pick up Evelina's baby from her. So Amelia had no idea that the baby's body had been found in the river. She was just going about her normal everyday life, collecting money to kill babies, basically. Now, Evelina was so worried about her new daughter and how well she would be cared for, she actually created a contract stipulating exactly how she wanted her daughter to be cared for and treated. And Amelia had been using a false name of Anne Harding. See, this is why I got confused. There were so many names, guys. She used the name Anne Harding 
and yeah, fake names with these people. So help me. She signed the contract and agreed to love and cherish the baby and raise her as her own. Oh, she's such a liar. And she did all of this for 10 pounds. That's it. 10 pounds. And later that day, she actually visited her son-in-law. They saw her walk in carrying a baby in a shawl. And she was carrying a carpet bag. After her son-in-law left the house and before her daughter could see, she actually wrapped sewing tape around the baby's neck and pulled until the baby died. And one thing I haven't mentioned yet is that she actually enjoyed watching the babies die. She got a thrill from it. Remember Jolly Jane? Think Jolly Jane when this woman is killing these babies. That's what's happening. So once the baby was dead, she actually wrapped it back up into the shawl and laid it on the sofa as if the baby was asleep. So no one questioned it because everyone just thought the baby was asleep. And her daughter and son-in-law actually went to the train station to pick up another baby for her at that time. It was a little boy. Now, by this time, police were really starting to dive into their investigation of Amelia. And she had no idea or else I'm pretty sure she would have fled. But instead, she was in the process of killing more babies. So the police would do an undercover sting operation to try and catch Amelia in the act of this. They had a young woman pretend to need Amelia's services and she arranged to meet Amelia at her home. This prompted Amelia to return back to Reading. And with the heavy carpet bag in hand, but no infants, she came back um, not knowing that one of the babies that she had killed had actually been found. So she got home and on April 3rd, the police knocked on her door and she was expecting this young lady to be dropping off a baby. But there were the police and they arrested her because she, she was in shock. She didn't know what was happening because she was not expecting the police. So she pr tried to pretend that she was someone else, but the police knew who they were looking for. They're, they were not dumb. And they began searching her home. They even asked her about the carpet bag that she had brought with her. And she said, I, I do not know anything about it. It's all a mystery to me. This woman was a chronic liar. And they actually found tickets for baby's clothing letters that she had been writing to and from the mothers and the matching white tape that matched the white tape that was around the neck of the baby they found in the river. Finally, after 30 years of evading capture and killing innocent police, she was finally arrested and taken to running jail. Once she was left alone in her cell, she actually took the lace off of her boat tied it around her neck, and tried to actually hang herself. It obviously did not work. Would have been too good of an out for her, so I'm glad it didn't work. On April 10th, the police dredged the river and found a carpet bag. The carpet bag containing the bodies of two babies, one of them being Evelina's sweet daughter that she was so worried about giving up. And it just like breaks my heart that that actually happened. Now, when Amelia heard about, her, so they actually arrested Amelia's daughter and son-in-law for accessory to murder. And when Amelia heard about this, she finally confessed and stated that she alone was responsible for the murders. They had nothing to do with it and they knew nothing about it because ironically, she deeply loved her daughter spoiled her daughter and would have done anything for her daughter and it's ugh, I just don't know how her brain works that way like how could you not see that connection with all these babies that you were killing oh it's disgusting so the police actually released her son-in-law but not her daughter they were still convinced that she was an accessory to murder 
And after a more intensive search of the river, they were able to find six more bodies of the young infants. And she told police, quote, you will know all mine by the ribbons around their neck, unquote. On May 22nd, 1896, at 59 years old, Amelia stood trial for the death of only one of her victims, even though they found more bodies. They tried her only for Elena's daughter, Helena. Her daughter's name was Helena, Helena Fry. And if found guilty, Amelia was going to hang. Now, obviously, Amelia pled insanity like she always did to get out of facing consequences. And her daughter was still being charged with an accessory to murder. And didn't hesitate to blame her mother, stating that her mother was crazy, had threatened her life on many occasions, and had even tried to take Marianne's life. She said her mother heard voices and all kinds of things. So her daughter, Marianne, was trying to distance herself from her mother. Well, at Amelia's trial, it only took two and a half hours to complete the entire trial, and it took the jury. Four and a half minutes to decide that Amelia was not crazy, but guilty of murdering uh, these poor innocent babies. So she was sentenced to death by hanging. And while she waited for her sentence to be filled, she took five notebooks full of confession and claimed that her daughter had nothing to do with the murders. And she often she claimed that she often felt peace after dumping her victims' bodies in the water and wrote to her daughter, I have no soul. My soul was hammered out of me in the Gloucester Asylum. I mean, I would agree with her on that. She definitely does not have a soul because she is pure evil. Anyways, eventually, after she had been, been hung, it was on June 10th, there's actually a crowd of over a thousand people that came to watch the noose be placed around Amelia's neck. And when they asked her, like, what are your final words? She had some pretty f- profound things to say. She was pretty humble. <laughs> I lie. She said, I have nothing to say. That was it. No apology. Nothing. I have nothing to say. It was. Ugh. So eventually, after her death. They made a song about her infamous actions that people would sing. I would sing it to you, but you don't want that. Nobody wants that. I promise. And they searched the river for a few months after the discovery of the initial body and ended up pulling over 50, 50, 50 babies' bodies from the Thames. That's just from when she lived there. Now... It's thought that she killed up to six children a day at her worst and had a total number of 400 babies killed by her own hands. And that is only if she killed one baby a month over her 30 years of killing. So it's a possibility that there could be even more victims because she had 30 years to do this. And if it's thought she killed six children a day, I guarantee there's more than 400 babies that died at her hand. So because of the callous way Amelia Dyer was able to kill the most innocent children, the most innocent among us, these little babies, just to earn a few pounds, and she was able to do it over the span of 30 years before she was caught, that is what makes her our horrible human in history for the week. Because she, oh, she's just gross and evil and ugh, I don't like her. <laughs> I really don't. I think this one's been one of the hardest ones out of all of the horrible humans, mostly because of the victim that she chose. So join us next week as we dive into another listener request. I'm actually excited about this one because this, this horrible human I know it's bad to have a favorite horrible human in history, but he's probably one of my top favorite horrible humans in history 
and everyone knows him, but shout out to Jason for this suggestion because we are going to be talking about the person who inspired Dracula. And if well, he didn't inspire Dracula, he was the inspiration for Dracula, I should say. And if you ask me, probably one of the most sadistic people to ever live. He killed from about 40,000 to 100,000 people in the most heinous ways possible. So tune in next week on Horrible Humans in History as we talk about Vlad the Impaler. And if you've never heard of him, you need to get out from under a rock because he is horrible. And I'm so excited to talk about him. So we will see you guys next week on Horrible Humans in History. Mm-hmm.